next scientist for us to welcome is Joy Hirsch. She is a professor of functional neuroradiology, neuroscience, and psychiatry at Columbia University. She's a curator of the exhibit The Brain, The Inside Story at the American Museum of Natural History. And Joy is a pioneering neuroscientist. Her research focuses on developing ways to image human brain activity during performance of complex behaviors. Her groundbreaking studies of language, emotion, attention, and cognition are, interna are internationally known for advances in our understanding of how separate neural systems interact during these functions. So let's get Faith off the stage and welcome some joy. I'm a neuroscientist, and I study the human brain. I study the human brain and mind because I think that it is one of the most important questions in science, and that is, how is it that the neurophysiological substrate of the brain actually creates the mind? That is, who we are, what we are, what we think, and what we do comes from this squishy little pile of neurons that we call the brain. How do they do that? And I think that that is the most fundamental questions in science today. But of course, I'm biased. I'm passionate about this subject. And I'm very honored to be here today to talk to you a little bit about the science. You just wind me up and turn me on, and I can talk for a long time about the science. But in addition to the science, because of the assignment of the um, World Science Festival, um, we've been assigned to talk a little bit about ourselves. And I find that a little bit more terrifying, <laughs> to put it mildly. We don't usually talk about ourselves. But this assignment has caused me to think a little bit about some things I hadn't thought of before. And the question that one comes up with, with at least I come up with, is why in the world am I so passionate about this question? What does this mean to me? And I think the signature for me as a scientist is the, the passion, the attraction that I have for an adventure, for a frontier, for the thrill of the chase, for going after something that is absolutely unknown. And I think that that describes all of us as scientists in some ways, is that we love going where people haven't gone before. Oftentimes, what I say to my students is that if you know what you're doing, you simply shouldn't be doing it. And the reason is because the job of a scientist is to go where we haven't been before. Well, so I asked the question, why, why was that my mission in life? And as a scientist, I have a hypothesis. And my hypothesis is that I was simply born with it. Now, there's a bit of evidence for that, and so this is the personal part of my talk. This terrifies me a little bit, but I'm going to share this with you. I have, I have an ancestry of pioneers. The first, the first pioneer in my ancestry is my great-grandmother. And this is not an ordinary woman. In the 1880s, she came to Oregon in a covered wagon. Now, she didn't just ride in that covered wagon like a lady of her time. She was hired by the wagon train because of her particular talents with a rifle. And she was, <laughs> yeah, my grandmother, she was hired by the men who drove that wagon train to be the guard of the wagon train. Now, needless to say, they got to Oregon quite safely. That was her frontier. She, along the way, had a child. That child, ooh, sorry, actually, back up. That was not their child. <laughs> I missed the slide. I'll tell you about the child in just a minute. This was her gun. 
Now, I've never fired this gun, but that picture was taken of me approximately two weeks ago when I went home to visit my parents, and I said, Dad, do you still have that muzzle loader? And he says, oh, sure, and he pulls it out. I cleaned the gun, and we took the picture. There it is. That's why she was, that's why we all came to Oregon, actually, because of that gun. Anyway, there it is. That was the tool of her frontier. Tool of a frontier, hang on to that word. Okay, she had a daughter. And this daughter uh, was, um, came with her actually as an infant on the wagon train as well. Um, and you can see she graduated from college. Um, but that's not what made her a frontier, although she was one of the first women to graduate from the University of Washington. She was a political activist, and apparently a pretty mean one, because she, <laughs> she actually fought for the women's right to vote in Washington. And then when they came to Oregon and the women didn't have the right to vote to Oregon, she went right to work again, and within one year, women had the right to vote in Oregon. I think about her every time I vote. So her frontier was not the wagon train, not the Rocky Mountains, but perhaps political activism. And then finally, third, my other ancestor on the other side of my family is my mother. And my mother, as am I, a descendant of the um, original American colonists. And so we come from a long family of people who came in the ship right behind the Mayflower. So was it no wonder that in the that in my blood, there's something about a frontier. It just sort of comes naturally. But my frontier isn't the Rocky Mountains. It's not crossing the Atlantic in a tiny little boat. And it's not political activism, although sometimes I think it should be. What, what my frontier is, is the universe of the human mind and brain. And I think that my approach to this science as a frontier um, has been quite appropriate because it's been a very new science. And there's just about everything you do hasn't been done before. And so it adds to the thrill of the chase for me. And so now what I'm going to show you is a little bit about how we do this, how we study the brain and the mind um, from a practical point of view. So I'm going to show you a little movie clip here of put one of my students going into the, a scanner, which is a very fancy camera, and we image people's brains. We take beautiful pictures of the structure of the brain. Nothing interesting about that. But what is interesting is that we ask people to do something when they're in the scanner, and we can actually look at the specific parts of the brain that are active during the execution of this task. And so essentially what this is, is the combination of two sciences. It's the combination of imaging science, where we image pictures we take pictures of the brain, but it's also the science of behavior, where we ask people to do things. And the integration of the two brings together mind and body, um, mind and brain, as we will. So here we are, this little picture. So you can get a, uh, uh, an image of um, what it's like to be in a functional imaging experiment, and you'll see the brain uh, flashing on the side as well, so you can see the brain as it's being imaged. Okay, Gwen. Okay. Why don't you just slide down a little bit? The first step in understanding how the brain is organized and how it works is to develop a task that people can do in the scanner. So, Glenn, what we're going to do is a simple picture naming task. Your job is, when you see the pictures, to name what you see in your head. There is an image of the language system doing object naming. Cactus. Pretzel. I don't know what you're called, but some people use them to count. What is that thing called? Okay, so that's an example of taking a picture of somebody doing a language task. Um, and it's a very simple thing to do. We, uh, we like studying language and we can map the language system um, very easily. And so uh, I was just going to give you kind of a life example of what it would be like if I were going to map any of your brains doing a simple language task and what that would look like. We would put you in the scanner and we would show you a series of pictures and we would ask you in the scanner simply to name them. And so you can imagine if any of you guys are in the scanner and I show you a picture, what's that? Yeah. Okay. 
All right. And if we did that about three more times, then we would get a picture of the brain, and your brains would look like this. And we would see pictures of the auditory cortex and some patches that we would give names to. We would call it Wernicke's area, Broca's area, and various parts of the brain. Okay. What we learn here is a basic principle of brain organization, which is we like to call the real estate principle. Now, we sort of made that up because it's a fancy name for the hypothesis of functional specificity. But you'll, rem you'll forget that, but you'll remember the real estate principle. And the real estate principle is simply that specific parts of the brain do specific things. And so the brain is divided up in little departments, and so you've got the department for the visual system, the auditory system, the memory system, the cognitive processing system, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, that's very interesting, but it doesn't really tell us how the brain works. And we as scientists want to understand the mechanism. How does it work? And so we dig a little deeper under the hood. And so we look at the brain in a little different way. And we can see that the brain is all connected with these funny little neural fibers. Now, this is the brain of one of my students. It's interesting, isn't it? Um, and what we've done is that we've just looked at all of the fibers in his brain. And so you can see that underneath all the gray matter there, there are reams and reams, miles and miles of fibers. And it leads us to the question of how does it work? And one of the things that we know is that trafficking in the brain goes at least in two ways. Things come into the brain. They come into the brain, actually, through the holes in your head. It comes into your brain through your eyes, your ears, your nose, your mouth, the things you feel. That's bottom-up stuff. It comes into the brain. The other direction of trafficking is what we call top-down trafficking. And that's the stuff you make up in your head. That's the stuff that you think about, you create, you, um, you memorize, you, you set goals, you make decisions. That's top-down. So these roadways, these fibers in the brain, are carrying information that go at least two ways. And we can think about mechanism of the brain for simple things like how you control your emotions as kinds of tugs of wars between circuits in the brain. So you can imagine that in an emotional system, you see something that scares you and you are afraid of it, stuff comes into the brain. The parts of the brain that are specialized for detecting fear, like the amygdala, and I'm sure you've all heard about the amygdala. It's kind of the fear center of the brain. Stuff comes in, the amygdala turns on. Then something else really neat happens. All this top-down stuff in the brain assesses how afraid you need to be, whether you need to run, or whether you can say, ah, there they go again. And that judgment, that control of the emotional system doesn't come from nowhere. That comes from a mechanism in your brain that is designed to control emotions. And so we consider this type of cognitive control or emotional control or this general class of neural circuits in the brain that work in pairs. Things come in, they're controlled, and the circuits send signals from the top to either upregulate or downregulate them as fundamental mechanisms of neural operation. Now, I'm just going to give you a little example of that and um, uh, to sort of give you a sense of how and what we study um, if I was studying an emotional system and how it's controlled. And so I would put you in the scanner and I would show you a series of pictures. Now, as it turns out, faces. Faces are stimuli that we are particularly sensitive to. We have whole specialized areas in the brain that are activated when we see a face. But we have an additional 
part of our brain that is specialized for when those faces contain emotional content. And I swear those areas are bigger in women than in men. <laughs> they must be. But Anyway, a fearful face is a face that is a particularly salient stimulus because it, it appears that it stimulates parts of the brain that even though you're not frightened of, it, it tells you that there's danger somewhere. And so the amygdala and other parts of the, what we call basal ganglia, and that's just a fancy word that says all that stuff down there in the brain that's sensitive to emotion, um, um, uh, are activated in the presence of a stimulus like this. So we present stimuli like this in lots of different ways to people in the scanner. And at the end of the day, we analyze a lot of data, and we come up with models of how it all works. And what we discover is that a picture like this, which, by the way, I think is one of the most beautiful maps in the world. <laughs> There's lots of maps in the world, but I think this is a pretty special one, and there are many, of course, like it. And so all you have to do is pick up the New York Times, just about every Science Times, and you see some map of the brain. This is your map. This is the map of your brain in love. This is the map of your brain, you know, doing a memory task, whatever, whatever. So you're, I'm sure that most of you are familiar with things like this, but we name parts of the brain, the amygdala and the frontal gyrus. And what we learn is that if we study these systems separately, that we can watch them modulating each other. So you can think of conversations in your brain between stuff coming in and the top-down neural circuitry that actually controls it and modulates it. And so those are the um, main type of models and ideas that we've spent a great deal of time thinking about um, in my laboratory. Finally, I'd like to close with this uh, not so beautiful summary slide, but this is my frontier. <laughs> and this is the human brain, and in it lies the secrets, I believe, of who we are, what we are, and what we do. This is the machinery that drives our loves, our joys, our memories, who we are and what we are comes from this machine. And it's, it's a, an honor for me as a scientist to spend my life trying to figure out how in the world it does it. <laughs>